Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Jar. My name is Chris, and we're so glad you chose to hang out with us today. All of you on the stream as well, we're so glad uh, that you're with us. Um, Tomorrow, something really big is coming up, and what is happening tomorrow? The solar eclipse. Like, there are going to be all these people in our town. We're welcoming them to come maybe for the second celebration, and uh, to learn about the solar eclipse. And uh, when I was thinking about the solar eclipse, if you think about it, what it is really about is the moon blocks the sun, and so it keeps us in the dark. And maybe for some of you, there's been a little bit of darkness uh, in your life. And if you think about it, really what happens with the moon is that in this one time, it surrenders all of itself to the rays of the sun. And we have something in the Christian faith where you surrender your life to God, to the sun, to the son of God. And that is baptism. And for some of you, maybe you've never been baptized before, and this could be an opportunity for you to do that. So next week, I'll be teaching on baptism in the community room, and I hope many of you, if you've never been baptized before, or maybe you were baptized as an infant, and you're like, hey, I'd like to do it as an adult, that you would take the plunge, that you would do that. Now, baptism, it does not mean that you have it all together, you're never going to mess up anymore. It just means you're surrendering to the Son, that you give your life to Christ. It doesn't mean that everything's going to change immediately, but it does mean this, that your sins are washed away and you are made brand new. So, next week we'll be having this, and lunch is provided, child care is provided, and I hope that many of you, if you haven't been baptized before, that you would take this time to do it. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can sign up for this. You can either, one, sign up on the back of your Connect card that Shiloh talked about. On the back side of that, there's a place that says, I'm interested in baptism. You check that off. And you say, that's going to be my next step. I'm open to it. Doesn't mean that maybe you'll even commit to it, but you're willing to come to the class next week. Or you can actually, for those of you that are on the stream or on the JAR app, you can actually go ahead and sign up on the app and you can push that button that says baptism. I'm interested to it. So I hope many of you, if you haven't been baptized before, you'll take that next step of surrendering to the Son. Let's pray. God, we uh, thank you so much for this day and your goodness to us. And we thank you for meeting with us in this moment. And God, I pray right now, if there's anyone who has interest in baptism of taking that next step, that you would give them the courage to do it. Help us now, God, to hear from you. We really want to hear from you. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us. Help us to understand that even in our doubts, that we can have a relationship with you because it's in our doubts that often grow us into a deeper relationship. So come now and speak to each person uh, in their seat and on the stream. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the first church that I pastored was in Flora, Indiana, where it sat in the middle of cornfields and hog farms. In fact, there were more hogs than people in the county. So if you were a single male, the truth is, is that you had a better chance of having a friend with a hog than you had a girlfriend. That's the way it was. And I love Flora because it was kind of a throwback to the Andy Griffith show. And that show, if you'll remember, everything happened on a front porch. And people in Flora had front porches all over the place. And everybody would talk to each other. And everybody knew each other's business, too. And in the midst of all of that, there was a a sense within the community that God was the center of everything. 
And it was there that I learned about the Bible and I read the Bible for the first time uh, all the way through. And I did that multiple times while I was there. And I learned about the Christian basic beliefs. And there was so much learning that I had from these farmers who had lived a life uh, of faith to God. And everybody there was comfortable with our faith because we all kind of believed the same thing. And there was a sense that there was a Christian worldview. And whether people went to church or not, they were connected in that way. Well, fast forward five years to where I entered a cemetery. I'm sorry, I meant seminary. And... um, When I walked into that place, what I found really quickly was I wasn't in Flora anymore. Flora had left. And now there were these smart people and really intimidating professors. And some of them, folks, didn't even believe about the basic principles of the Christian faith. And these students, they weren't sure about God and they would question things about the resurrection and they would tell us different perspectives theologically. And they talked about scripture being fictitious and nothing but myths and that there was all these things that were inaccurate and could science and, you know, the Bible actually coexist. And man, I got confused and I started to have a lot of doubts. If you remember last week, I talked about a moment of doubt when I was sitting in this front row, but seminary that first year was like a season of doubt. And I started wondering, can I trust the Bible? Is Jesus the Son of God? Is the Bible just full of stories that are myths or are they really true? And I begin to start having these doubts about, am I going to actually give my life to living something that I have a lot of doubts and questions about? And again, it wasn't just a moment of doubt, but this was a season of doubt. And maybe for some of you, either on the stream right now, that you have some uh, doubts and you're in a season of doubt. Or maybe if you're in there in the auditorium, you're in a season of doubt as well. I mean, if someone were to ask you, what are some of the doubts that you have about Jesus or the Bible or Christianity? What is it that you would say if you could honestly say it? Maybe you've wondered, is Jesus the only way to God? I mean, there's all these other religions and these other ways, but it seems a little arrogant to just say it's one way. I mean, there's so many people in the world, so many other religions. Maybe for others of you, you doubt about whether science and the Bible can coexist. Can they meld together? I mean, they seem to contradict each other sometimes. Maybe for others of you, why do you doubt? Maybe it's hard for you to reconcile how can there be a loving God and yet allow so much pain and suffering in the world. Maybe when you look at what's happening in Gaza and Israel or in the Ukraine and you see innocent people dying in war, you're like, where is the justice in this, God? Because injustice seems to be running rampant. Young boys or young girls that are sold into slavery or maybe even worse, young girls that are sex trafficked for their whole lives and they only know of using their body to make money for someone else through sex. Now, maybe for some of you it's not that, it's way more personal to you. Maybe for you, uh, you prayed and you prayed and you prayed for a loved one of yours who had cancer to be healed. And the truth is, is that God could have done it. He had the power to do it, but it didn't happen. Or you prayed and prayed for your parents' marriage to stay together, and then they got divorced. Or maybe for others of you, you were deeply wounded by the church. Or maybe there was a church leader who you looked up to so much and then they had an affair or they stole from the church or they lied about you and put you down and hurt you in a great way. And so now you kind of doubt this whole Christianity, this whole church thing. So why do you doubt? 
Well, the good news is, is that we are not the only people ever to have doubts. In fact, the Bible is filled with tons of doubters who became great, faithful women and men of God, but there were doubts. And there's one that I want us to look at today is one that Jesus actually handpicked. His name is Peter. Now, I love Peter because Peter was complicated. And I'm complicated. And sometimes my faith is very complicated. There's a story in Matthew chapter 14 in which one day Peter and the rest of the disciples are in a boat on Lake Galilee. And as they often did, they were fishing and they finished their fishing. And it's at nighttime when all of a sudden, as they're there, Jesus starts walking up to them on the water. But they didn't recognize him. And even though these were some big, tough, burly fishermen, they started crying out, it's a ghost! Oh, it's a ghost! And Jesus is like, calm down, calm down. It's not a ghost. It's me, guys. It's me, Jesus. So in Matthew chapter 14, as Jesus is walking on water, in verse 28, Peter cries out, Lord, if it's you, Tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, it's me, come. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came toward Jesus. Now, spoiler alert for those of you, uh, Peter actually in this story, if you've never read it before, Peter gets out of the boat and he actually starts walking on water and then he sinks into the water. And most of the time when people read this story, they're like, ah, poor Peter. You know, he just didn't have much faith. That was what the problem was. He just didn't have much faith at all. And, uh, you know, that's why he sank. Um, he just is a loser when it comes to faith. And he sank. But the more that I've read this story and I've learned more about this whole passage, this is what I've learned. Peter's the only one that got out of the boat. The other 11 stayed in the boat. Peter is the only one who had the courage to actually get out of the boat and outside of Jesus, he's the only one we know in history that walked on water. He's the only one who had the courage to do this. So we need to give a little bit more love to Peter, I think. Now, in the same way that he had faith to get out of the boat and to follow Jesus, we're also going to see that he struggled with this faith. Just like each one of us. Many of us in this auditorium and those of you on the stream, sometimes we have great faith and sometimes we have great doubt. The scripture goes on to say this, as he's walking on water, this is what happens. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, Jesus said, why did you doubt? Now, to be honest, for years, this passage really bothered me. In fact, it made me feel guilty because I knew that I've had many times of moments or seasons of doubt in my life. And because I had doubted multiple times, I just started feeling less than every time that I would read this story. It's like, I'm just like Peter. That's who I am. But as I've matured in my faith and as I've learned more about the character and nature of Jesus... What I've learned is that Jesus is always loving, he's always giving, he's always gracious, he's always compassionate. Jesus is always understanding of us, even in our doubts. And so it hit me that maybe I've been reading this passage the wrong way. And maybe, just maybe, when Jesus said, why did you doubt? What if it wasn't an accusation but it was actually an invitation. What if it wasn't Jesus like condemning, condemning Peter, you of little faith, but it was actually an invitation. 
Instead of it being like, Peter, why did you doubt? You're such a doubter. Well, why don't you just go ahead and sink, you big loser? Sink, that'll teach you. What if instead of that, it was something different? Because after he doubted, is that what Jesus said? You big loser, go ahead and drown. Is that what he said? No. The scripture actually says that he reached out his hand and he pulled him up. You see, someone who is loving, when we have doubts he ha and we're drowning in our doubt, one who's loving reaches out and pulls us up out of our doubts. Last week, we talked about Thomas who doubted. And yet Jesus reached out to him. And now we have another story of Jesus loving Peter so much that instead of condemning him, he reaches out and he brings him up out of the water. In fact, I actually think that Jesus was smiling when all of this was going out. He's like, Peter, you got out of the boat. That is so awesome. And Peter starts walking. He's like, you're doing such a good job. And then Peter took his eyes off Jesus, just like you and I do sometimes. And then all of a sudden he started to doubt. And when he took his eyes off, he saw the circumstances around him like we do, the hurt, the pain, the struggles, whatever it is. And he took his eyes off. And in the midst of that, then he began to sink. But Jesus was so excited that he got out of the boat that when he started to kind of sink, he's like, oh, Peter, Peter, here, let me help you, man. Why did you doubt? Don't you remember the loaves and the fishes? The water into wine, the person who wasn't blind, and then now they can see they couldn't hear, and now they can hear. Don't have little faith, Peter. Believe in me. Folks, from a loving Savior, what we find is that it wasn't an accusation, but it was actually an invitation. And that's our big idea this morning, either for those of you on the stream or here in the auditorium, either in your program or on the app. Here's our big idea. When you doubt, Jesus doesn't accuse, he actually invites. When you doubt, Jesus does not accuse, he actually invites. So for the rest of our time, what I simply want to do is talk to two groups of people who I think are in this auditorium or on the stream today. The first one is those of you who are currently having some faith doubts. And if you are, it's okay. Many of the people who have great faith and have done amazing things in Christianity had huge doubts. And it's not unusual. Peter was one of them. And that's why I just want to remind you, your doubts don't disqualify your faith. Your doubts don't disqualify your faith. And the second group I want to talk to are those of you who may want to help people who have doubts, who have questions. Because many people have left the Christian faith or are thinking about leaving it, not because God isn't good, but because Christians have become so fragile that they get upset if someone has doubts or questions. And we need to learn to listen and to listen out of love. And to follow the example of Jesus that we don't accuse people for their doubts, but that we actually invite them into a process with them. That we are not arrogant thinking that, hey, I have it all together or judgmental of saying you don't. But that we would actually choose that since we've been given two ears and one mouth, that we would listen twice as much as we talk. Plus, this is what I want you to know. Even though many of you would say, well, I get my beliefs, Chris, from the Bible. I get it from the Bible. Well, you might get it from the Bible and your faith may be true and biblical and God honoring, but it always comes with some filters. We always experience our faith through filters. It's through the family background that you were raised in. It was in where you were raised, what culture you were raised. You read it through the type of church that you were raised in or maybe no church at all. 
You read it through the way that potentially your parents vote and you read the Bible the way that they voted. And so I like this or I don't like this. And your beliefs go through all of this. And because all of us as human beings are flawed, not everything that you pick up along the way when it comes to your faith is true. Let me give you an example. Uh, as many of you know, I was raised a PK, a preacher's kid. I was raised in a, a denomination called the Church of the Brethren. Now, some of you might be going, that's a weird name. Like, were women invited to this place or just the brethren? No, the sisters and the brothers both could come together. And it was a great denomination and uh, so many good people and, and people that loved God. And we talked a lot about God. We talked a lot about following in the footsteps of Jesus. But every time that the Holy Spirit would come up, it was crickets. Like no one wanted to talk about the Holy Spirit. So after I had my season of doubt, I was like, I want to go on a faith exploration. And so I started learning about the Holy Spirit in many different charismatic churches. And these churches were amazing churches, wonderful churches. Um, they, and I learned so much about the Holy Spirit. I learned that the Holy Spirit is my comforter, that he is my guide, that he convicts me, that when I sin, the Spirit reminds me, you're going off a little bit. It gives me spiritual power. I actually have spiritual gifts that are given from the Spirit. I learned in that culture that I could raise my hands in worship and I wasn't going to hell. And, you know, if I kept them down, I wasn't going to hell. And that I could move my body and I could say amen and I could clap and I could do everything. And people were great. They were amazing. And then one day, a friend of mine who was exploring all of the Holy Spirit with me, we went to a conference called the Holy Spirit Conference. And we were so excited. It was in Virginia. And we went to a hyper charismatic experience. Do you know what? Any of you ever been to one of those before? I mean, they're flying through the ceiling. I mean, it's like up and down the aisles, like people are worshiping Jesus. Like it was amazing. And I loved it. And so during the conference, uh, we went to a small group and the small group leader sat us down and then they looked at us and they said, have you received the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues? Now, if you've never heard someone speak in tongues before, it's really cool. And it's like a spiritual language that is given by God to connect with God. And when it's done in church, there should always be an interpreter who can interpret those things. And it can be a powerful experience when it's done in a biblical way. Well, a year before this conference, I'd received the gift of tongues, and I still use it sometime in my prayer life and uh, sometimes when I'm worshiping. But in the midst of all that, my friend Todd, who had been a missionary for years and years to Africa and to other places, he had never spoken in tongues before, and so he told them, well, I've never done this. And uh, they said, well, would you like to receive the gift right now? And Todd was a little bit worried because he's like, well, the Holy Spirit gives that gift, not you, but I'll be open to it. And so we sat there and they grabbed our hands and they said, right now, we just want you to listen, loosen your lips and just start going, mua, 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 mua. And then all of a sudden they said, or you might do something like this, um, bapa, um, bapa, um, bapa. I'm not kidding you, telling you the truth. And all of a sudden, I thought it was like Elvira of the Oak Ridge Boys. Um, bapa, um, bapa, um, bapa, mow, mow. And all of a sudden, we do this for like 20 minutes, and the spirit is not moving for Todd to speak in tongues, but he keeps going, um, um, bapa, um, bapa. And finally, we go through this whole experience, and it hit me that what they were teaching was not of the Bible. That the gift of tongues is a gift and it's a valuable gift, but the Holy Spirit gives that gift, not all of this. And I looked at him, I said, you know what? I know you guys have good hearts right now, but he's not going to receive the gifts from you. If he receives the gift of tongues, it will come from the Holy Spirit and we're leaving. And we stood up and we walked out and these people were kind of shocked. But this is what I realized, that they were not teaching the Bible the way that it was supposed to be taught. And true story, true story of what had happened. 
Now again, they were great people. They loved God. I don't question any of that. But you don't get the gift of tongues by saying something over and over again for 20 minutes until that happens. The Holy Spirit will give you that gift as he gives every gift. And the greatest gift, Paul said, that we could ever have is the gift of love. Folks, as you go through life and as you read the Bible, you're going to pick up on some things and people sometimes will give you things that are extremes that really don't make sense at all. And they'll have a narrow little view. Maybe some of you have some of those, not just what I shared, but maybe you have some of these. You can't go to movies or you can't dance or there are some places if you don't name it and claim it and grab it and blab it, you're not a faithful person. Or if you vote blue, you're not a Christian. Or if you vote red, you're not a Christian. And those people that vote those ways, we should not have relationships with them. Or you can't listen to secular music. Or you can't wear makeup. Or you can't be baptized this way or that way. There's only one way you can be baptized. And you have to have communion like every single week. And you have to pray for an hour. And the only version of the Bible is the King James version. That's what you have to read. And I could go on and on and on for hours about some of these narrow things. And then one day you actually wake up and you recognize that everything you believe about God may not be true. But when you discover that parts of what you believe might not be true, it doesn't mean you have to leave the faith. It doesn't mean you have to walk away from it. You simply let go of what is not true and you hold on tightly to what is true. Let me kind of give you a human example of this. The first house that Jennifer and I bought was an amazing house. It was awesome for three years. And then after three years, we noticed that there was this orange dust that was all over the place. And Jen was getting really concerned. And I wasn't very emotionally mature at that point. And so she was really concerned. She said, look at all this yellow dust. And this is what I said. Well, it sounds like to me you need to dust more, woman. Like, you need to get in it. I don't think you're, you know, strong enough. You need to really clean that. And I'll never forget this. Great lesson. My wife walked out of the room. She got a pledge can. She came back in. She gave it to me. She goes, you go after it, big boy. You dust it. (laughs) And we both, like, started dusting, like, all of this. And we're all dusting and dusting. And nothing was changing. The dust was still coming in. So we hired some people. And they came in with a robot that went down into our duct work. They went around, and because our house was built on a floodplain, what had happened over time is that it had deteriorated uh, the pipes underneath it, and the pea gravel had come in with that, and it was blowing this dust through our air registers. So, what did we do? We deconstructed it. We tore out the bad stuff. We cemented the air registers. We put new ductwork into the ceiling and we went on. That's what we did. Now, just to be clear, there was only parts of the house that were bad, not all of it. And so we didn't burn down the house. We didn't say, oh, the whole house is a mess. We're just going to throw it all away. We took parts that weren't good and we replaced it with what was good. And folks, when you discover something that you believe isn't true, you just unbelieve what isn't true and you pursue what is true. You don't just walk away from all of it. You just choose to unbelieve what isn't true and you pursue what is true. So, how do you build a belief system? Well, again, we all come with our own perspectives into this. But for me, it is the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Like, this is a guide for your life. 
If you drive a car, if you do anything in life, there's usually a guide that shows you how to do it. And for me, this is the guide. And you try to come to the Bible with your most sincere, objective view in a heart that is open to a loving God. And how do you do it? Because it can be very confusing reading the Bible sometimes. Well, my most simple advice for every single person, including those of you on the stream, is that when you start to read it, you read it by leaning into where the love of Jesus is found. You read through the lens of Jesus himself. And if you're stuck, if you have questions, if you have doubts, you begin by reading the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus. You focus on the Son of God, Jesus himself, and you live there. You look at how he loved. You look at who he loved. You look at those that he treated, the the outcasts, the filthy, the lost, the sinners. And you read the Bible through the lens of Jesus's love. And then what's going to happen, though, as you read the Bible, at one point you're going to be like, I want to be right. Oh, I want to be so right in the Bible. I'm going to be right in the Bible. And then if you have a heart that's softened to God, this is what you finally realize. That the Christian goal isn't to be right. The Christian goal is to be loving. The Christian goal, that's your next fill-in, isn't about just being right. It's about being loving just like Jesus was loving. Now, let me come back to our two groups of people. First of all, those of you who are doubting, you have some spiritual faith doubts right now, and you're considering maybe moving away from the faith. Or secondly, there's some of you that want to help people who might be considering leaving the faith in their doubt. Remember Peter, our very first story? Remember Peter? Peter, in many ways, he he doubted. But he didn't just doubt, he actually even denied Jesus. On the night of Jesus' trial, as he is going through this process, what we find is that Peter denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And then he runs off and he hides himself away from everybody else. And in the midst of Of all of this, he has this moment where he thinks there's no way God could ever forgive me for denying him three times. And in this whole process, as he is by himself hiding away, he meets with the disciples one day and Jesus walks up to him. And just as he had reached out his hand when he doubted him when he walked on water, Jesus reaches out three times in forgiveness and he says to him, I'm going to change your doubts to being forgiven. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Come, Peter. I know you love me. I love you. If you love me, you'll feed my sheep. And then when the church started on the day of Pentecost, on the first Sunday, where they met as a church in a large setting, guess who gave the message? Peter, the doubter, the denier. And he stood up, and when he talked on that day, 3,000 people gave their life to Christ. Folks, Peter, whose faith was full of doubt, proved that doubt is not the enemy of faith. But doubt is actually an invitation to a deeper faith. Because when Peter doubted, Jesus reached down and he lifted him up. He didn't accuse him. He invited him into a greater faith experience. And today, even with your doubts, even with your questions, even with the things that you don't understand, Jesus doesn't accuse you. He invites you into faith. And one step of this relationship with Jesus into faith is to remember what he did on the cross. And the way that we do that here in the church is through 
an experience we call communion. And Nathan's going to come right now and lead us uh, in this experience. Come on, Nathan. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, well, hey everyone, um, before we take communion, uh, I'm going to give us an opportunity to have a confession of faith prayer together. So if there's anyone in here right now um, that's doubting, that's struggling with doubt, I think one of the most beautiful things about Jesus, like Chris talked about in his teaching, is that in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our uncertainties, Jesus doesn't leave us to figure things out on our own. Instead, he walks right beside us the entire time. And so maybe you've come into this place today. Maybe you're feeling a little bit like Peter. Maybe you're saying, you know what, Nathan, all this church stuff, all this talk is good. But the truth is, is I don't even feel like I'm in the boat right now. I feel like I'm sinking in the water. Maybe you feel like I am drowning in doubt, in uncertainty, and in hopelessness. And if that's the case with you, I want to remind you this morning that just like Jesus was with Peter... He's standing right there with his hand reaching out to you. And all we have to do is respond by taking his hand. And so if you're in this place right now and you're saying, you know what, Jesus, I need you in my life. I need your love. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I want to invite you into this prayer with me right now. And this isn't a prayer that you're going to say on your own, but we're going to say it together. And so if you feel called to do so, will you please pray and repeat after me? Jesus, forgive me. Make me brand new. I believe you died and rose again so I could live with you. Fill me with your spirit so I can know you, follow you, and serve you for the rest of my life. My life is not my own. Today I give it to you. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, if you've made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I invite you right now to go ahead and grab your communion cup. Now on the top, there's a clear plastic coating here above the bread. I'm going to ask that you go ahead and remove that, take the bread, and hold it in your hand. <clears throat> on the night that Jesus was betrayed and handed over to be crucified, he was with his disciples. And he stood up and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And now if you would, peel the, uh, the thick plastic over the juice. And in the same way, Jesus held the cup and he said, this is my blood, which was shed for you. Take and drink. <clears throat> Will you pray with me? Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God who doesn't run from our doubts, but instead runs towards us when we're sinking. Jesus, we believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for allowing your truth to be the light in our darkest times of doubt and worry. Help us to give you our questioning, for we know that nothing is too complicated for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, let's hear it for anyone who did that for the first time today. Well, it's at this time I want to go ahead and invite our prayer people to go ahead and come forward. If there's anyone in here who needs prayer for absolutely anything, we would love to pray for you. We're going to have someone standing here and someone standing up top. And they, uh, yeah, they'd love to pray for you. So if you came in here for the first time and signed a Connect card, I want to ask that you go ahead and drop those off in the black boxes as you leave uh, so we can connect with you. With that being said, thank you so much for choosing to spend your morning with us here at the JAR. Uh, go in peace and know that you are loved in this place. Thank you.